The Oracle Network. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors and... Reverie True Crime listeners. Welcome to our sinister series for the month of October. We're your hosts, CJ... And Paige. Join us as we tell you stories of where something evil lurks in the spirit of Halloween slash spooky season. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. This is an incantation from three Scottish witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Throughout the history of time, it seems people have been fearful of witches. Many felt witches were trying to cause harm to others through mystical means. The origin of witch hunts began towards the end of the 1400s and carried on through to the end of the 1700s. But of course, this does not dispel the modern day witch hunts of one Paige and I will be discussing later this month. Egyptians, Celts, and nomadic tribes seem to be really three of the ancient civilizations that harbored absolutely no fear of witches. But the rest of the world in the Middle Ages demonized certain people. People who didn't fall into societal norm, mostly women, many who were lesbians, or at least thought to be. From the 1300s to the late 1600s in Europe, there was a major hysteria around witchcraft, or the devil's magic. It began centuries ago when Christians, along with a few other religions, were convinced that Lucifer, the devil himself, could give those known as witches terrible power. The power to cause pain to others and gain the devotion of those same people. Mainly women were accused of practicing witchcraft. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of women that were being murdered because of all the talk of this witchcraft frenzy. The Salem Trials in Massachusetts, USA began to happen when the dust was finally settling on this European craze and fury. Salem Village is now Danvers, Massachusetts. Things got a little outrageous in 1689. William and Mary, who were English rulers, went to war with France in American colonies. This was called King William's Wars, and this war wreaked havoc on upstate New York, Nova Scotia, and Quebec. People fled to Essex and many to the Salem Village, located in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. There were a lot of issues, but the main one had been Reverend Samuel Paris, the very first ordained minister of Salem Village. He became the minister in 1689, A lot of people said he was stern, harsh, and money-hungry. So he was not the most liked person in the world, that's for sure. January 1692, his nine-year-old daughter Elizabeth and Abigail Williams, his niece, who was only 11 years old, started having what they tended to describe as fits. The children were throwing things, screaming, and making weird noises. Which, let's face it, most children have temper tantrums, right? However, the one thing they did that freaked him out was they were twisting and contorting themselves into really bizarre positions. I wish I knew what these positions looked like, because kids can be silly and do things they're not supposed to. Take, for example, a kid standing on their head on a couch. 
As adults, we tell them to get down and stop acting silly before they hurt themselves, and they think it's hilarious. Kids can be silly little weirdos, and I'm not quite sure what they considered strange so-called contorting positions back then. The kids could have learned how to do a backbend, and now the whole town is freaking out. Who knows? Also, just to throw in some science from 1976, published in Science Magazine, it was stated that these bizarre behaviors of people who were accused of being witches in Salem could have been due to fungus ergot, which is found in rye, wheat, and some cereals. Toxicologists said that if other foods happened to be tainted with this fungus, it could cause vomiting, delusions, hallucinations, and muscle spasms. This fungus grows in warm and damp conditions. The Salem village was said to be an area where swampy meadows were common and rye was the essential primary grain there in spring and summer. But science aside now, the reverend took the children to a doctor because he was seriously worried and the doctor said it was something supernatural and not normal. Another 11-year-old little girl, Ann Putnam, was experiencing the same things. Again, these are kids probably acting out and doing crazy kid things, but under a lot of pressure from magistrates Jonathan Corwin and John Hathorne, the three girls did blame three other women for their actions on February 29, 1692. These three women were Tatuba, the Paris family's Caribbean slave, Sarah Good, who was a homeless woman who panhandled, and Sarah Osborne, who was a disadvantaged and underprivileged elderly lady. On March 1st, 1692, these three women were taken in to stand before the court, and they were interrogated for days upon days. Sarah Osborne, the elderly lady, said she was innocent, and so did Sarah Good, the homeless woman. However, Tatuba had a confession to make. Quote, the devil came to me and bid me serve him. End quote. She talked of black dogs, red cats, yellow birds, and a black man who wanted her to put her signature in his book, which she said she did. Tatuba explained there were various other witches that wanted to take down the Puritans. After that, all three of them were locked away. Now, with everyone in panic mode and the rumor mill buzzing for many months, another woman was charged because certain people were suspicious about her. This woman was Martha Corey, and she was a devout member of the church in Salem Village. Then, there were officials wondering about Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter, Dorothy. Four years old. Being questioned surely had to be intimidating for a child so young, and her shyness and quiet answers were twisted and turned into a confession. In no time, there were over dozens of people, not only from Salem, but other villages in Massachusetts who were taken in to be interrogated. On May 27, 1692, there was Governor William Phipps. The first person he had looked into was Bridget Bishop. This woman was older, loved to gossip, and dare I even say promiscuous. I know, really witchy, right? She had run-ins with the law, and people had whispered years before that they thought she was a witch. She was brought to the court and questioned if she did or did not practice witchcraft. Bridget said, quote, I am as innocent as the child unborn, end quote. Unfortunately, she was found guilty. It's suspected that from the very beginning, she was only on trial because it would be an easy win. 
on June 10th, 1692, she was the first person ever to be hanged on what would later be known as Gallows Hill. At the time, a lot of evidence was based on pure speculation and even people testifying about what they dreamt about. A very respected and admired minister named Cotton Mather wrote a letter to the court about how they should not allow this type of so-called evidence. His advice and wishes fell on deaf ears. Five more people were hanged in July, five in August, and eight more in September. That October, Cotton Mather's father, president of Harvard during this time, said, quote, It were better that ten suspected witches should escape than one innocent person be condemned. Governor William Phipps had a change of heart after that because his very own wife was being accused of witchcraft. I guess it didn't feel so great when his wife was suspected of practicing the devil's magic. So, he said no more arrests should be made, and he let go most people who had been accused of being witches and shut down the courthouse on October 29th. When he did reopen the courthouse, he made some alterations to the rules. Evidence that was based on speculation alone was not allowed anymore, and only three out of 56 suspects were punished. Governor Phipps did eventually get to a point by May of 1693 where he exonerated everyone who were locked up on indictments of witchcraft. Even so, by this point, too many lives had been taken. On Gallows Hill, 19 people were hanged, including a 71-year-old man who had been crushed with heavy stones until he perished. Several passed away in jail cells, and hundreds of people had been blamed of performing the devil's magic. January 14, 1697, the general court did request a day of fasting and called for everyone to explore in their souls because of the misfortune of Salem. In 1702, the court did admit that the trials were basically against the law. In 1711, there was a bill passed to give the ones who were blamed back their good name and rights. There was also money given to their heirs. There was never a single apology officially from Massachusetts about all that took place in 1692 and the few years that followed, until 1957 a little over 250 years overdue. According to the book, The Societal History of Crime and Punishment in America, quote, A number of historians have speculated as to why the witch hunts occurred and why certain people were singled out. These proposed reasons have included vendettas, fear of strong women, and economic competition. Regardless, the Salem Witch Trials are a memorial and a warning to what hysteria, religious intolerance, and ignorance can cause in the criminal justice system. End quote. While over in America, witches were on trial and being hanged when they were found guilty, in Europe, things were just a little bit different. Oh, the persecution of witches was still prevalent thanks to the Catholics and Christian sphere of demons. Tens of thousands of women were being gathered and slaughtered for being witches. Heavens forbid a woman was born a lesbian and liked the ladies. If she did and took a female lover, it had to be the work of the demon or the devil himself possessing her. Although sexual identity wasn't really back then how we know it today, There were no labels, just feelings and attractions. If a person was born gay and had same-sex attractions, or if a person was born the wrong gender and they had some type of gender dysphoria, 
They knew they had to hide it because anything that was not considered societal normal was considered demonic. The purging of witches in Europe started in the 1400s, and it continued on through the mid-1700s. And to be quite honest, we know it carries on through today. It's called a witch hunt, and we'll get to that a little bit later on in our series. And then we have our witch hunters. Many who were clergymen, they would seek out women with what they deemed to have unusual behavior. One of the tests to find out if a woman was actually a witch was one that was called the swimming test. The woman was tied up, thrown into the water, and if she drowned, that woman was not a witch. She was dead, but at least they knew she wasn't a witch. If the woman was able to unbind herself and get out of the water, <laughs> she was a witch, because she had the help to escape from the devil. That woman was then burned at the stake. It sounds as if you were suspected of being a witch back then. You were going to be damned either way. There are some very heinous murders of presumed witches in the world's history, for sure. In the English channels, a fight ensued between Protestants and Catholics. Three Protestant women who were presumed to be witches, they were tied to a stake and lit a fire. As the fire started to burn, one of the women gave birth. The baby was pulled from the fire at first. But then it was tossed back in because it was believed to be a descendant of the devil. I hate to say this, because I'm probably talking about my own family line somehow, but the people back then were kind of stupid. There was a woman named Katharina Heno in Germany. Today, she would be considered a successful businesswoman. But back in the early 1600s, her assertion was considered aggression and manlike. In fact, many women who came across as too independent were forced to wear a muzzle in public. That would hinder the woman quiet. Katharina came from a family of successful politicians. Her behavior was a learned behavior from her family. She was accused of being a witch and practicing witchcraft, which of course she denied. She wasn't believed, so she was tortured and eventually sentenced to death. Her jurors and judge decided they'd do her a solid, since her family was prominent in the community and all. The jurors strangled her before they burned her. In all honesty, with the exception of Iceland, who went on witch hunts for men, nearly all of the other witch hunts were predominantly for women especially in Scotland. Maud Galt was one of these Scottish women. Maud was born in 1620. If alive today, she'd be 401 years old. Maud lived in Kilbarchan, Scotland. During a good portion of Maud's life, Scotland was going through what was called the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. It was a religious war with England and all about the reform of religion. Protestants, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians, they all had one thing in common. The fear of demons, witches, and lesbians. Growing up, Maud knew she didn't have an attraction for boys. She liked girls. In order to live her life and her truth, Maud always knew that she would need to get creative to do this. Maud married a man named John Dickey to be her beard although it's unknown whether John knew he was a spouse of convenience or not. John was a right, that's W-R-I-G-H-T, which is someone who is skilled in making wooden objects. He must have been pretty successful at his job, too, because the couple, they were wealthy enough to have servants, at least two. Maude and John never had any children. But as I stated, they did have a couple of servants. One of these servants was a maid named Agnes Mitchell. Maud was highly attracted to Agnes. Maud was considered by many to be an assertive woman. She went after what she wanted, and she could be very persistent in her ways until she got what she wanted, too. Some today might even call her abusive with how she operated. 
Maud persisted with Agnes until she did get her way with her. The two would have sexual encounters together. And either Maud pissed Agnes off, or Agnes decided she couldn't take what Maud was doing to her anymore, and she approached what is called the Kirk Sessions. The Kirk Sessions is simply local churches holding court and proceeding over alleged criminal acts. Church court, I guess. It's a process that still goes on today in Scotland. In her Kirk session, Agnes spilled all about the acts of her employer, Maud Galt. Everything that Maud was doing to her, performing on her, including the use of a clay phallic piece to penetrate her. Today we call them dildos. Agnes actually brought this clay dildo to church with her to show the people in the Kirk session. The church was aghast. They were astounded when Agnes passed around the clay phallic to show the court. Agnes claimed that the shame of the injury that was done to her prevented her from reporting these acts to the proper authorities. The church court felt this was a sin to try to counterfeit a man by making his penis for a woman's pleasure. This had to be witchcraft. Damn it! That means 99.5% of all women today are practicing witchcraft. Agnes went on to tell the court, Maud not only raped her, but other servants as well, including servants that worked for her neighbors. For the church, witchcraft was much easier to cope with than lesbianism. They dropped the allegations of rape that Agnes brought forth and they decided to do their own investigation into Maud for being a witch. The end of Maud's story is very surprising and anticlimactic, I'm afraid. I fully expected her to be staked and lit on fire for her supposed sins, but it seems the church court dismissed her case. Maud lived to be a ripe old age of 50 in Scotland. I know that doesn't seem very old, but given it was the 1600s, back then the average lifespan was only 35 years old. 50 was kind of ancient. The people of this medieval time period believed that there were two types of magic. Natural magic, which was acceptable because it was simply the powers of God in nature, like a thunderstorm, and demonic magic associated with witchcraft and demonology. Backtracking a few hundred years from Maud, a 19-year-old girl claimed to hear the voices of Archangel Michael, St. Catherine of Alexandria, and St. Margaret of Antioch. She had confessed that she had been hearing these voices since she was 13 years old. At the age of 17, the girl went to see Prince Charles VII, son and heir of King Charles VI. Charles VI had died when the prince was only an infant, so King Henry V was appointed as king until Prince Charles VII was of age to take the role. There's actually a lot more to the history of all this, like why Henry was appointed and stuff like that, because Henry was English and this was France. But if you're interested in that history, I'll let you look that up on your own. I'm here for the witches. When the girl went to Charles VII, he was now more than of age to take his rightful place as king of France. She told Charles God said France must prevail over England, and she was so compelling when she spoke to Charles VII, he supported her idea to dress as a man and fight in a war against the English to help him take the throne back. In case you haven't guessed it, this girl was someone you most likely have heard of before. Some called her Saint Joan, or Joan of Arc, but the name she was given at birth wasn't Joan at all. It was Jeannie, or Jehan d'Arc. So for the sake of argument and the remainder of this story, we're just going to call her Joan. In 1412, Joan was born a peasant girl in a village in France. She grew up illiterate, not able to read or write. This did not make her dumb, however. Joan was shrewd and motivated. She was also very passionate in her beliefs. Her parents owned about 50 acres in their village. To supplement their farming and ranching income, Joan's dad was a village official. There was a day during her 13th year. 
Joan was in her father's garden. That is when she said the voices of the saints came to her. Personally, I still say people who hear voices like that have some screws loose. And Joan might have. But she held on to what the voices told her until she was 17. And that's when she convinced a commander to let her approach Prince Charles VII. Dressed in men's clothing, Joan went to the court where the prince was. Inconspicuously, she walked past the other men at the court. She confidently strode up to the prince, asked for a private minute of his time. The prince granted Joan a listen. He must have been surprised to learn Joan was a peasant farm girl, but he was drawn in by her conversation. The prince was skeptical Joan could fight an army of men, let alone lead an army of men. But the prince was desperate to end the war between France and England, and he really wanted to be king. This was all happening during the Hundred Year War. The Hundred Year War had already gone on for 75 years. Almost immediately, Joan did go to war in a suit of white armor atop a white steed. I should say Joan didn't just go to war. She led several of the battles, and Joan won most of them. One of the Crusades was to liberate the territory of Orléans, in which Joan was successful. When the new King Charles VII had his coronation, Joan was invited, and she stood right beside the new king. At the age of 18, Joan tried to liberate the territory of Paris for France. She failed in that battle. She was thrown from her horse and left outside the town gates. She was caught by the English and held captive for months. Eventually, Joan was exchanged for 10,000 francs and returned to France. King Charles VII wasn't sure what to do with her. He began to distance himself from her, believing this bitch was crazy pants. Ultimately, she was turned over to the English church for heresy, which I admit I had to go look up. It's beliefs that are contrary to Orthodox religions. Joan was tried for 70 counts of various crimes, including witchcraft, heresy, and dressing like a dude. In a month's time, she was interrogated 12 times. She was held in a military prison rather than a church prison. Her captors threatened her with rape and torture. To combat the threats, Joan tied her soldier clothing tightly around her with hundreds of little cords, and that had to make using the bathroom damn near impossible. Joan was found guilty of her charges, and on May 30th, 1431, she was taken to the marketplace at Rouen in France. There she was burned at the stake in front of about 10,000 people. Joan has always been somewhat of an LGBTQ plus icon. For a very long time, people thought she was a lesbian. Others thought she was trans, and still some today think she was intersex, maybe asexual. There's no real documentation regarding Joan's sexual or gender identity. Suffice to say, Joan's truth might have been a more complex label than any of us have credited her for. Joan dared to bend societal norms, and I know in my eyes, that makes her a rebel and a saint. Real quick, I want to throw out there this information of a TikToker that's gone viral. And even though it's current day, I think it's kind of funny because it is relevant to this episode's theme. The TikToker is named Lyriette, and she states that her and her boyfriend were lesbian, which is in Ireland in the 1500s. Their forbidden love was discovered, and they were burned at the stake. The couple believes this because since they've been together, they've experienced a lot of deja vus. The couple also went through past life regression meditation. This is where their past love relationship was revealed to them. On her TikTok, she even showed pictures of what she imagined they'd look like. And they were both really hot. That's not meant to be a pun on being lit on fire. Honestly, I like the whole idea of reincarnation. 
And I do kind of wonder why we occasionally get feelings that we've known someone our whole lives, when in reality we might have only known them for a few hours. Be sure to join Paige and I for our next Something Evil Lurks episode on Australian Vampires. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>